Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the day that the Lord has made. Will we rejoice and be glad in it? Oh, come on, Cedar Grove. This is Women's Day. This is a day that we have declared that we have fear, faith over fear, that we are women motivated by faith, and it is nothing but the grace of God that has allowed us to get to this place in our lives. So I give God praise for this opportunity to be here. Pastor McQueen of St. James United Methodist Church and First Lady Wanda McQueen send their love and their regards to you. I ask that you keep them in prayer. Pastor McQueen's sister passed this morning. He's already on his way to Philly next weekend for a cousin's funeral, and now he has his sister's funeral. So please remember them in your prayers. I want to give a special shout out to the Singletons for this invitation. I don't take it lightly because you don't have to ask anybody to do anything. Amen. But you thought it a pleasure to invite me and I give God praise for you. I also give God praise for my mother who is here with me this morning. Wave, mommy. <laughs> That's my road dog. She travels wherever I go. She jump in the car and go. So I give God praise for her. And I give God praise for you for just being who God has called you to be in this community. But we always need faith-filled, Holy Ghost-filled church folk in the world to make a difference wherever they are. Amen? So let us go to God in prayer. Most gracious and holy God, we give you praise for this is the day that you have made. And Lord, we are rejoicing and we are glad in it. God, we ask now in this preaching moment that you would open the ears and the hearts of your people. Lord, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but Father, your word stands forever. So Lord, dissect this word in as many ways as persons gathered in this space. Lord, allow it to penetrate to the very places that you need it to. And Lord, I thank you that when we leave this place, we shall not leave the same way that we came. But Lord, we leave different. We leave changed. We leave restored. We leave healed. And we leave better and equipped to go out and make disciples of Jesus Christ. So Father, have your way. In spite of me, with me, in me, in this place, in Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture has already been read in your hearing, but I just want to lift up a few verses from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, and then verse 11. Faith is the reality of what we hope for. The proof of what we don't see. The elders in the past were approved because they showed faith. By faith we understand that the universe has been created by a word from God so that the visible came into existence from the invisible. Verse 11, by faith even Sarah can receive the ability to have a child. Though she herself was barren and past the age for having children, because she believed that the one who promised was faithful. So for a sermon title, Work Your Faith. Work Your Faith. In July of 2016, I received a text from a dear friend of mine who was stating that she was being admitted to the hospital after a follow-up visit to the doctor. They did not have any beds available to her at the time, so they took her to the emergency room first because she was having some breathing difficulty. 
And while in the emergency room, they drained about eight liters of fluid from her abdomen. And they shared with her that they saw two masses from the CT scan. Later on that night, as she shared this report with me, both of us were in shock, but we had an assurance that all would be well. They scheduled the surgery for the following Monday, and the two masses were removed, and we agreed in prayer that she would be cancer-free. So after the surgery, the report was as follows. Two masses were malignant tumors. So a complete hysterectomy was performed, along with the removal of her spleen and a portion of her colon. At the conclusion of the surgery, all affected areas were removed, and she was cancer-free. Now, did this miracle happen as we expected it to? No. However, God was faithful to his word and his character in the midst of it. And why did we have such an absolute resolve that everything was going to be all right? Because God had done it before for others. And based on their testimony, we believed that God could do it for her. She had come too far in her walk with the Lord to waver in the midst of this trial. And God had already proven himself to be trustworthy in her life up until that point. And now, even though she was facing a new trial, God had proven faithful. And he was allowing her to be stretched in this season. So as we turn our attention to our text, the author of Hebrews is unknown, and one scholar puts it this way, who it was that wrote this epistle, only God knows. And since we don't know either, what we do know about this letter is that it was addressed to believers who had come to the faith through the testimony of eyewitnesses. They were not new Christians. They had a relationship with God already. They had fruitfully endured hardships because of their commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But unfortunately, many of them had become what they called dull of hearing and were drifting away from the faith. Some of them were even on the verge of lapsing into Judaism to avoid being persecuted as a Christian. They were not willing to stand up for their faith. So the writer of Hebrews gives them his working definition of what faith is and recounts the stories of people who had maintained their faith in God and held fast to the promises of God. The whole chapter is geared toward the human response to the divine revelation of who God is and what faith looks like. So what is faith? Faith is trust in the divine promises distinguished from seeing their realization. Faith is trusting in what God says, even when you can't see what God said. Faith is the only true medium for righteousness, because you can't be saved without faith. And in the book of Hebrews, it sets forth two things about faith. One, that God is and that God is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. So faith apprehends as real fact that which is not already revealed to our senses. So in other words, faith sees something before it's actually seen. Repeat after me. Faith sees something before 
is actually seen. In fact, faith acts on what it doesn't see. Faith responds to what it doesn't see. Faith is upheld by what it does not see. It's almost like a contradiction because we always hear this term, if I can see it, I'll believe it. But faith says I believe it and I'll just wait to see it. And if you really think about it, our whole life is built on faith. Because every person came in here and sat in a pew and did not expect it to turn over when you sat down. You had faith that that pew was going to hold you up. You and everybody on the pew with you. You didn't walk up to anybody and say, this is my pew, don't sit here. I don't know if it's going to be able to hold all of us. So you get on that pew, you get on that, this is my pew. First pew, first come. So for everybody that didn't get a single pew, then I don't know what you're going to do. So you have faith already. When you put something in a mailbox with a stamp and an address on it and something in it, you have a full expectation that it's going to get to where it's supposed to get to. When you go to the bank and you deposit a check, once it leaves your hand, you have an expectation that your account is going to be credited the amount that you deposited. Without fear, without worry, you have a receipt for your deposit. Yet when it comes to life and things that God has promised, we allow fear to overtake our faith when worldly things we have no problem with putting our faith in. Faith is not passive, it's active. Faith is not something you just keep on the shelf until you need it. Faith is fuel that keeps us moving forward with God. Faith must be exercised so that when our faith is wavering, when fear rears its ugly head, the writer of Hebrews reminds us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So ladies, if you are going to have faith over fear, then first, Faith gives us assurance of things hoped for. This word assurance in the Greek is hypostasis, which means it's based on that which has a firm foundation. Our faith is not based on something that will collapse, fall apart, break down over time. It is based on a firm foundation. When you build a house, the most important thing is the foundation of that house because it does no good to get all the upgrades in the house, to pay all the extras for the house, to get the top of the line appliances, the marble countertops, Install a smart system so you can operate everything in your house from your cell phone and be worried about two, five, ten years from now is leaning a little to the left. You wondering why stuff is sliding on the table. You can't figure out why the door won't close like it used to close. You're having problems opening the door. Then you get the door open, you can't close the door. The foundation is shifting. So we have to have a firm foundation in believing who God is and that if he said it, then that's it. You can't waver. 
Your foundation in faith has to be that God is, and whatever God says, that's it. Amen. Then the second thing, if you're going to have faith over fear, is that faith gives us a conviction or a persuasion of things that are not yet seen. To have faith in God through Jesus Christ is to declare, like Paul declared, I am persuaded. It's almost like if you got this foundation of faith in the fact that God is, and whatever God says, whatever God has done in the past, he is well capable of doing again. Now you have to sometimes persuade yourself to stay right there, to trust that, to not waver, to not doubt, to not fear. So how does one have an assurance or become persuaded? Well, if anybody's ever had to go to court and you had to get an attorney, the attorneys present evidence to the jury through the testimony of witnesses. Because the jury was not there, they don't have firsthand experience or knowledge. So the jury only hears the testimony of the witnesses that the attorneys call. The job of the defending or persecuting, prosecuting attorney is to convince the jury that the persons they bring before them to testify are truthful witnesses. The jury does not know because the jury was not there. The jury has to be convinced based on the testimony of reliable witnesses and the evidence that is presented in order to decide the verdict. So likewise, the Apostle Paul was not there at the resurrection of Jesus. He was not there in the upper room on the day of Pentecost with the disciples. He was not there when 3,000 people received salvation after Pentecost. He had to hear what Mary Magdalene had to say when she went to an empty tomb. What Peter, James, and John said as he was persecuting them he had to hear what Stephen said, even as he was dying. And believe what Stephen, I believe what Stephen said. We all know that Paul was the one persecuting Stephen. He was there when Stephen was killed. And I believe at that moment of Paul hearing Stephen's confession and faith and trust in God, in spite of the fact that he was about to be killed, that something started churning on the inside. I believe that that's when Paul's heart began to soften and when God's prevenient grace was growing on the inside of him. That was the beginning of Paul being persuaded in his faith. So as he was on his way down the Damascus Road, it was no coincidence that something happened. Because once you start hearing about God moving, once you start hearing testimonies of other people, once you start hearing something that actually relates to you, something that you're going through, and then all of a sudden somebody tells a testimony, well, I've been through that already. Your ears perk up. Something in your spirit starts to leap a little bit. And so it was no surprise that Jesus would meet him because he was starting to open up to what God might be doing in his life because he had already heard these testimonies and it was not merely the luck of the draw that he would have this divine encounter. So Paul went from hearing a testimony of those with firsthand experiences to actually having his own encounter with the divine presence of Jesus Christ himself. That is why Paul could boldly say, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, 
nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. So Paul in this epistle is saying to us, the jury of 2018, to make a decision for faith. Because juries make decisions based on faith, not facts. In the kingdom, in a court of law, all they have is what they have. They may not get the whole story. The attorney can bring who they think is going to prove their case. But in the court of the kingdom, we have the testimony of all saints that have gone before us in Scripture. And our decision is based on faith, not on facts. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. So when we realized that we were not there when Jesus healed the sick and raised the dead, we were not there when Jesus fed thousands with two fish and five loaves of bread. We were not there when Jesus hung on the cross interceding for them and us. We were not there when he was laid in a borrowed tomb. However, we, the jury, have the testimony of everybody that was there. We have their written depositions to read for ourselves the details of how they kept their faith, how they stood their ground until the promises of God were fulfilled. Those in our text had faced some trying times, and the writer was urging them to listen to the testimony of those who held on to their faith even in the face of fear. They did not waver. They stood their ground. So when things get hard, and they will, when the struggles come, and they do, we all have a plethora of thoughts swirling around in our minds, and it's easy to fall into fear, to question, to doubt, and allow our own faith to waver. But it's in those times that we must work our faith. Work actually means putting forth effort to achieve something. It's not enough to say, I believe. How do you know you believe? You have to put your faith into action. You have to confess what the word says, not what the world says. You have to declare, I am healed in Jesus' name. The doctor's report is what it is. That's a fact. But faith says, I am healed by the blood of Jesus shed on Calvary's cross. So we have to solidify our faith, base it on the firm foundation of the word, and make sure that our persuasion stays in the direction of who God is. So my same friend that had this surgery, spent almost a month in the hospital. And after that surgery, she could not eat or drink for over a week. And of course, she was frustrated. She, we couldn't bring food in the room because she would want the food. And to even have a piece of ice was a luxury because having had all of those things removed, you can't just start eating and moving stuff around. They had to make sure pieces were working at the right time. And as people started to visit her, because not a lot of people could visit her at one time, the thing that blessed me was that people would come into the hospital to see about her. She prayed for every person that came in. Every person that came, she said, the Lord said, I need to pray for you. She is in a hospital bed can't half lean to the side, yet she say, take my hand, and she would pray for them because she just believed that God was going to make a way.
that whatever the end was going to be, it was going to be fine because God was with her. That, to me, was the epitome of what faith looks like. Because it's easy to talk about faith until you find yourself in a situation where you need faith. Where the fear comes in and wants to take over. And health is always a big issue, especially when you get a doctor's report that it could go either way. And you have a choice at that time to decide, am I going to trust God? And I'm gonna, am I going to walk with God through this? Because the number of people that she blessed, the nurses, the doctors that she prayed for, people that she led to Christ just because she was in a hospital bed, would not have happened had she gone through what she went through. Trusting in what you have yet to see. Believing that all is well, even when it's not well, even when you don't feel well. Knowing that God is with you as you go through, which reminds me of my favorite scripture, which is Romans 8, 28, because all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. And because she had been such a blessing to the staff and the people that came in and out of her room. One of the nurses actually gave her this card, and she read it every day, and she shared it with me. And I was dealing with a crisis of faith myself as her friend assigned to pray her through this. And the card simply said this, faith is knowing in your heart what you cannot see with your eyes. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, believed in, and brought to God in prayer. Faith is deep. Faith is strong. Faith is real. Faith is getting out of bed when you want to pull the covers over your head. Faith is a nudge, a whisper, a shout from your soul. Faith is substance for a moment, for a day, for as long as it takes Faith is the answer no matter what the question, problem, or situation. Faith is what it is. Faith is everything. So in order to work your faith, I suggest that you create a faith file. A faith file. Everybody needs to keep a file of faith stories. You need to write your own version of Hebrews. Start with your grandmama's testimony, your granddaddy's testimony, your mama's testimony, as you receive testimonies of people that have exercised their faith, who have walked through situations and circumstances and told you about it. You need to write it down and keep a faith file. Because the doubt is going to come. The disappointment is going to come. Fear is going to come. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So how do you defeat fear? With faith. Because you can't have faith and fear at the same time. Either you're going to trust God and believe God, or you're going to shrink back and be fearful about what tomorrow is going to be. And as the acronym is, faith, fear is false evidence appearing real. You don't know what's going to happen until it happens. So when fear creeps in, I need you to consult your faith file and put your own stories of faith in there because God is no respecter of persons. If he's done it for one somebody, then he can do it for you. Hallelujah. So work your faith. Amen.
church, say amen again. Are you ready to work your faith going forward? Are you ready to work your faith going forward? Know of who we are. We got here because God loved us and we worked our faith. For anything can happen to us. And being African Americans, we had to work our faith. We had to work our faith stronger than almost anyone else. For we are still here today. We have been through hell. We have been through tribulation. We have been through trials. We have things thrown at us, spit on us, held us down. But it's our faith that we can look to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, get me through this. Are you ready to work your faith this morning? 